Uh, but you just give it up one time for my friend, Doug Jansen. Awesome, brother. Love you, man. Awesome, awesome. All right. Well, hey, guys, it's awesome to be here with you guys today, and it is an honor. I love Mike and Caitlin and the family, and it's been such a blessing to see them not only you know, growing in their faith, but leading an amazing church and seeing God uh, use this in, an, in this community in such a powerful way. So love you guys, proud of you guys, excited for you guys, and uh, we're praying for you. We're believing for all that God has for the next steps and what's ahead, and it's going to be great. And so what an awesome thing. But uh, let's, let's pray together. So God, we just lift this time to you and ask that you would meet us in an amazing way. We ask that you'd speak to us and encourage our hearts and Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in this church. What a blessing, God. What an awesome thing. And we pray you continue grace over everybody, strength over everybody, uh, wisdom, insight, provision, God. I pray for the next steps, what you have beyond this service, Lord, and into the coming years, Lord, that you'll provide in unthinkable, unimaginable ways, God, and that you'll just encourage this leadership so much. We thank you for everybody here. In your name, amen. So life is difficult sometimes, right? Uh, a few years back, it was uh, the day before Father's Day. We were going to go to a family party, and I'm like that guy who thinks I have way more time to do something in the yard than I really have. And so like 12 minutes before we have to leave, I'm like, I'm going to take this little tree down. And so I go out in my backyard, I climb a ladder on a chainsaw, and I, I have my chainsaw in my hand, and I'm cutting this tree down. Next thing I know, I don't know how I pulled this off, but I hit my thumb with the running chainsaw. And so I threw the chainsaw, like kind of like somehow climbed my way down the ladder. And I don't do good with blood. Like I'm awful with blood. So I'm like just like screaming and my wife comes to the back door and my son grabs a towel and wraps my hand up and I wait for the, uh, the ambulance to get there and take me to the hospital. And my wife had to follow me in the car so whenever they were done putting my finger back on, um, she could drive me home. And so I'm sitting in the, in the emergency room, waiting room. You would think they'd bring you right in for a chainsaw injury. No, I waited hours. Um, and so I'm sitting there like trying to not lose my mind. And my wife eventually texts me and says, I just pulled in. And my first response was to send a thumbs up emoji. <laughs> and I'm thinking maybe I should have chose like a heart or like something else, right? Like, life gets difficult. Why can't it just be easy? But it's not. And we go through hardship, and we go through difficulty, and there's pain, and there's challenging situations that we face. And so today, I just want to encourage you guys, and I don't want you to feel like I'm laying all these heavy weights on you, like, okay, I have to do all this stuff when I go through difficulty, because sometimes it could feel like, all right, the difficulty is enough. Don't give me like 17 things to do, because that's just adding to the difficulty. But I do want to give you a couple things to do and a couple things to get deep within you so that when you go through it, you, you know what to do. You're equipped. And some of you guys are like, I'm already going through it. I'm already right in the middle of the worst of it. And some of you would say, well, I'm doing all right. But as we know, and I'm not trying to speak something negative over us today, but men, we all go through difficulty at times. There's going to be days ahead. We're going to need to be able to say, okay, I know what to do, or I'm already equipped even. I already have deep within me what I need to go through this difficulty. So I want to ask two questions today. The first one is this. What truths do we need to get deep within us? for both times of celebration and difficulty, right? Like there's ups and downs in life and there are some truths that can help us navigate those times. What if there were some truths deep within our souls that would come rushing out on the good day and the bad day, right? Some things that kind of kept us stable in our faith, in our emotions, in our mental health, uh, some, um, some things that would cause us to not forget God when things are good and not curse God when things are bad. So what kind of truths do we get deep down within us today so on the day of difficulty or celebration we can stay consistent in God? And secondly, just really practically, what do we do when life gets difficult? What practical steps could we take when life is really hard? Uh, you know, sometimes I think we believe the lie that we just have to kind of like sit back and take what comes at us. But what if there are some practical things we can do when life gets really hard to be able to face those challenges? Like just a practical step. I was on vacation this summer, and I ate horribly, like horribly, and I've, I've been putting on some pounds lately, and I got home from vacation, and I went to put a pair of my shorts on, I couldn't get them past my thighs, and I was like, this is bad, and then I realized it was my son's shorts, thank God, praise you, Jesus, but, but I'm on vacation, I'm eating horribly, and one night, I'm in the hotel, 
and I have this horrible pain in my chest and back. Like It felt like heart attack pain, but I knew it was gas pain. And so I drove to 7-Eleven. I bought some gas X because that's just a practical step, right? I don't have to just sit there and suffer. There's some things I can do to combat the pain. And the same is true for the difficulties in our life. But I will be honest with you and real with you today that when I went to get the gas X, I also bought a candy bar. Because uh, why not? I bought gas X. It's going to take care of it, right? So, so don't do the, that, that part of it. But, but take the practical step. And we're going to see some practical steps today. And my pastor growing up used to say, I'm going to throw some shoes out into the crowd, and if they fit, put them on. Okay? So in other words, you don't have to wear all these shoes necessarily, but maybe a few of them or one of them will really stand out to you, and you can kind of put it on and wear it, and you can apply it to your life as you're going through some hardship. Maybe you're somebody here today just kind of like checking out God, checking out church. What is Jesus about? And you live in a world of difficulty too. And we have a God who wants to meet us at those difficult places of our life. He wants to walk with us. And I want you to hopefully be able to take some of the things that we look at this morning and and let them go down deep in your soul and uh, bring encouragement and help you know what to do. And I hope you'll see the amazing love of God for you. He loves you so incredibly much. So we're going to look at Psalm 118, not the whole psalm, but the first uh, several verses, and Psalm 118 is a psalm of thanksgiving. As much as it's a psalm of thanksgiving, it's coming out of times of difficulty, right? Like, like it's written at a time of celebration, probably when they were rebuilding the walls or they were rededicating the temple, but it comes at a time of like celebration after hardship and after really difficult things and themes. Um, the last part of the Psalms here that we're going to look at is th- this whole chapter was written as a, a collection of Psalms that would be sung at the time of the Passover. So I want you to think about this. As we're going through this Psalm, here's some pretty cool lens to, to kind of have on as we do it. Um, Jesus, the night before he was crucified, very likely sung this Psalm with his followers as they celebrated Passover. Okay, so that's going to give us a cool lens as we go through this, the first few verses of this psalm, because like, wow, okay, the day would likely come because this is what traditionally was done at the time of Passover, where the Jewish people would come and and, and celebrate this psalm. So, So Jesus, like very likely, said these words with his followers the night before he was crucified. Uh, this was Martin Luther's favorite psalm, who, if you know anything about Martin Luther, had incredible impact on the Christian faith. And also, we're going to hit a verse that really is dear to my wife and I, and some difficulties she's gone through and is going through. And so I pray that the encouragement we find from this passage will also encourage you. King David is thought to be the author of this psalm. And so let's get into question one. What truths do we need to get deep within us for both times of celebration and difficulty. Look at this, Psalm 118.1 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. So this is an interesting passage because David is like celebrating what God has done, and he breaks up the audience into different groups And he tells them, okay, if you're a part of this group, I want you to say the the Lord is good, his love endures forever. If you're part of this group, I want you to say it. So there's this like call and response that's happening here. And I think that's really powerful. So here's what we're going to do here. I want to just practice this with you today, okay? Because I think this is part of the truth we have to get deep within us, all right? So if I name a group and you're a part of that group, then I want you to say back to me, his love endures forever, okay? So let Retro Church say? His love endures forever. All right, let the adults say? Let the few kids say, yeah, I knew that's how that was going to go. That's all right. That's, that's how it would go in my church there, right? No problem. That's all right. Um, let the country music fans say, okay, we need a little more twang. We're going we to try that one again, all right? Let the country music fans say, come on. All right, that wasn't bad. We had a little twang in there. Sports fans say, all right, there we go. I was going to go Yankees, Mets. Let's not do that. All right, we got, we got an election coming up this week. There's enough uh, division, right? We don't need to, right? But if David wrote this, passage as they were celebrating the the rebuilding of different aspects of this nation, then, man, we have to remember it came out of a time of great difficulty, that there was hardship. But there was also a time of celebration, right? So again, difficulty, 
right? Good day, bad day, celebration, defeat, right? There, these truths are things that were key to David all the time, right? These were things that were deep down in his heart all the time. And so I want you to just, what would it look like for you this week, right? You get a great phone call, you get uh, amazing doctor results, you get uh, the raise that you were hoping for, or you get a really difficult phone call, or that same person that has been causing life to be really painful in this last season is at it again. Like, what if these truths, that we're going to celebrate this amazing God that we can give thanks to, that he's good, that his love endures forever, that we can give thanks to him, that he's good, that his love endures forever, that, like, what if that kept us, right? Now, let's look through the lens of Jesus. Let's just say it's the night before Jesus' crucifixion, right before he's going to go through all the trial. He's about to be arrested. He's about to be betrayed by his followers. He's about to be betrayed by Judas. Like, imagine him saying these words, right? Imagine him with his guys, and going through his head is maybe, I will be arrested tonight. If I'm going to give thanks to the Lord for he's good, his love endures forever. Maybe he's thinking as he's going through this psalm with his followers, you will all be afraid tonight and run. My closest friends, you'll all betray me, but give thanks to the Lord for he's good, his love endures forever. Tomorrow, humanity, the people that I love and came for, that I created, that I passionately desire a relationship with, will mock me and spit on me and brutalize me and whip me and nail me to a cross. But the Lord is good. I'm going to give thanks to him and his love endures forever. See, just because things get difficult, don't stop saying the Lord is good. Don't believe that he's stopped loving you. Don't believe that his love somehow has stopped enduring. And so you lost your job. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. The, med the medical report isn't what you hoped it would be. You're not where you are in life. Maybe you haven't felt God in a while. Maybe you once felt him so close. It was like, man, every time I pray, it's like he's answering a prayer. But, but lately, it just hasn't felt that way. Let that truth within you, deep within you, I can give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. See, for you and I, the ups and downs of life can make us feel so like almost like I'm just like a seesaw, like back and forth in my emotions, back and forth in my mental health, back and forth in my faith. Like one day I'm ready to conquer the world for Jesus. The next day I'm like, God, where are you, right? Like isn't that kind of how we can all feel sometimes? But if down deep within us were these truths, then we can celebrate our God in the most wonderful of times and the most difficult of times. We can allow these truths to be that guidance for us. And I love in Deuteronomy 6, God has given the commands to the people, and he tells them to do something with these commands, okay? And I, and I think we can apply them to what we're talking about today. Look at Deuteronomy 6, and it says in verse 6 and beyond, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And God's just basically saying, get this stuff deep within you. Like, make, make sure it's, it's down there so that when you need it, you can draw from it and use it, right? And I think that the same truths could apply to just this simple principle today, this, this man, I'm going to give thanks to the Lord for he's good as love endures forever, man, that that would be like just all in us and all over us, that we would encourage each other with it, that as we just sang today, right, like, I love you, Lord, right? I'm going to mess up the lyrics. I'm terrible with lyrics. Like, I'm a musician, so I listen to the, to the beat. I can tell you the drum beat to that song really well. But, but the, the words, that they would be something like, I, I'm just thankful, like, in the beginning of the service, I'm just sitting there reminding myself, oh, God, you, you're good, right? Like, all the days of my life, you've been faithful, right? Like, these are truths that we need deep down within us. Let's get them in our hearts. Let's impress them on our children, Let's talk about them as we come and go, right? I, I love that idea of even like writing them on our, our, our foreheads and doorposts. And I don't think we have to like actually get caught up in this. Although when I was in college, I used to write a Bible verse on my hand every day. It was just a practical way to keep God's truths in, in my mind. Like with all that ink poisoning, it's no surprise I don't have hair, but, but it was worth it. I remember going into a Bible test one day and my professor is handing out the test and he's like, 
looking at my hand. He's like, you have verses written on your hand, Doug. He's like, what's up with this, Jansen? You're taking a Bible test, and you got verse. I'm like, no, no, no. It's like, so I stay encouraged with the Lord, and so that I don't forget these truths, and he kind of had a good laugh about it and let me take the test, but don't get hung up on like actually writing them on your forehead or the door frames of your house, but what does it look like to get the truth deep within you so that when you're celebrating or when life is difficult, you can give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Get that deep within you. Some of us are saying, well, I'll get it deep within me when the trial starts. No, get it deep within you now so that it pours out when the trial starts. Some of you would say, oh, no, I'll, I'll, you know, when, when I start to forget God because life's good, maybe then I'll remind myself. No, get it in you now so when life becomes amazing and you're at the mountaintop that you continue to remind yourself it's him. See, Israel had this pattern. When life got good, they forgot God. And it was in the difficulties that God allowed in their lives that often they would come running back. And so what truths do we need to get down deep within us? Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. No matter what you're facing, no matter how hard life is or how good life is, that is the truth that we cling to. That should ooze out of our lives if we ruminate on that day in and day out. Yesterday I was just mowing my lawn and I'm just thinking about some difficulties in my life and I had just come back to this passage, come back to these verses. and I'm just mowing my yard back and forth saying that simple phrase over and over and over again and that that would be deep within us. Question two today, what do we do when life gets difficult? Okay, so we know the truth that hopefully we'll have within us so it comes oozing out when we need it, but, but when life does get difficult, what are some things we can do? Well, David shows us some really practical things. Psalm 118, five says, when hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. What does David do when things get difficult? He cries to the Lord. Again, if the shoe fits, wear it, right? Like, are, are, are you crying to the Lord? Are you going to the Lord passionately as life gets difficult? Are you kind of like in default mode, like, oh, Jesus, like, are those the first words out of your mouth? Like, Jesus, help me. Like, God, how I need you. You, you know, he longs for you to desire that closeness with him. He longs for you to come to him. He longs for you to cry out to him. I've seen lots of kids here at church today, which is an awesome thing. And as parents, we love it when our kids come to us, Right? As they run to us, as they fall and, you know, scrape a knee and they, they come running to us, we get to pick them up and hold them. And it's like, yes, let me comfort you. Come to me. And I love that David says that God brought him into a spacious place. So he cried to the Lord and God brought him out of a constrained place, unlimited place into freedom, right? Some of you could say, man, I'm just in a constrained place right now. I'm, I'm limited. I feel like I'm imprisoned, maybe with a struggle, a temptation, a situation that's outside your control. And here, David cries to the Lord, and God brings him into a spacious place. So what do we do when life gets difficult? We cry to the Lord. What else do we see here David doing? It says, the Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. Everybody say, I will not be afraid. Not be afraid. He says, what can mere mortals do to me? What does David do when life gets difficult? He refuses to be afraid. Some of us are here today to hear this part of the scripture. I refuse to be afraid. Some of us become terrified about the future. We catastrophize everything. We believe that all the worst things are going to happen at just the same time. And I'll tell you, if there is a struggle that I have in my life, it's this one. I can be the worst offender when it comes to just allowing my mind to run to the worst possible scenarios and lose myself in that. And I think it's a common struggle of our day. But I love that David refuses to be afraid. Let me encourage you with some reasons why you can refuse to be afraid. First off, God has protected us more times than we know. I fell through a skylight. I fell off a ladder. As I told you, I cut my thumb with a running chainsaw. I've done a lot of stupid things in my life. Imagine the things I don't know that God's protected me from. He's protected you from things that are unthinkable, things that if you look back, like I wonder if the day will, will come when we get to heaven and God just opens up the, 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 big, the big projector. I'm sure there is one up there somewhere. And he just displays all the times he protected us. And if I could just give you some peace, I want to talk about not being afraid. Some of us believe that when we get to heaven, there's going to be this movie playing of our worst moments in life. Maybe we heard a preacher say that when we were a kid or something. That's so unbiblical. That's not going to happen. 
Right? What do we champion about Jesus? That he's our savior, that he's forgiven us, that he has tossed all our sins into the sea of forgetfulness, that he separates our sin as far as the east is from the west. And we celebrate that all of our lives and we go, I'm forgiven and God's chosen to forget my sin. And then we all believe, but when I stand before him, he's gonna blast me. Man, let's just allow that fear to fall off. Right? His love for us is so great. And so he's protected us in ways that we can't even imagine. And another thought, when we go through something difficult, God provides grace and strength for that difficulty, right? Like I think many of us who know Jesus for a long time have experienced that. I went through something unthinkable, but God gave me the strength that I needed to go through it. When we fear, we're projecting ourselves into a future that we currently don't have grace and strength for. Do you know what I mean by that? Right? Like when I'm fearing, like, oh no, oh no, what if I go through all these things? I'm projecting myself into those things that I don't have grace and strength for from God because I'm not going through them. And I'm all worried about it and I'm losing myself and I'm losing sleep and I'm anxious about it all because I don't have the grace or strength to face it because I don't need the grace or strength to face it because I'm not going through it. And sometimes we just are so far in the future ahead into all that mess, we're missing the grace and strength that we have for today and the current things that we're walking through. I was recently reading through my journal from a few years back, and I'm not a great journaler, but once in a while, I'll just kind of get in there and I'll explode on it. And I was looking back at all these different things that I was fearing, and only one of them happened, and I got through it, because God's grace and strength was there. So refuse to be afraid. Don't project yourself into the future, because you don't have grace for that, because you don't need it right now. When people go through difficulty, we have to remember God uses it for good, right? Refuse to be afraid because everything I go through, God's gonna use for good. Again, I know I'm throwing a lot of shoes out into the crowd today, but just put on what applies to you. Somebody recently hurt me in a, in a really deep way, probably within the last year. And I have to tell you that that deep pain that I experienced from what that person did was the answer to so many of my prayers, like God used that specific situation to free me from weights I had been begging God to free me from. And it took that betrayal, it took that hardship and that difficulty for God to kind of work all that out in me. And I actually found myself recently thanking God for that time. God, thank you for that person. I mean, I would never choose to go through it again. It hurts so bad. But God, thank you so much for allowing it because that time of difficulty produced such wonderful, incredible things in my life. So let's remember Jesus likely sung this psalm with his followers the night he was betrayed. And imagine him again singing through this, thinking through what David was writing here about refusing to be afraid, about the things that would come, thinking about all that mankind would do to him, and yet the good that God would bring from it, the amazing salvation of the world, and so refuse to be afraid, everybody. God's protected us more times than we know. We're not gonna project ourselves into a future we don't currently have grace and strength for, and when we do go through it, God uses it for our good. Refuse to be afraid. He goes on in verse seven, he says, the Lord is with me, he's my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. So David says, okay, I, I get to celebrate because God came through for me and I triumph over my enemies. Now, I want to give you guys like a key to understanding the Psalms. This is so important, okay? Sometimes David says some really messed up stuff, okay? He says things like, God, break my enemy's teeth, right? And it's like, David's a psycho. Like, what's going on here? Like, what's wrong with this guy? In reality, what we have to remember is David wasn't just a guy, he was a king, and so some of his prayers aren't just like, oh God, this guy Bob at my office, break his teeth, right? Like he's praying for his nation that other nations are coming to decimate. Like I don't think we would fault uh, Franklin Roosevelt during the World War II praying, God, break Hitler's teeth. He's a monster. He's, destroy he's doing horrific things to people who are innocent, right? So as a, as a leader of a nation, he could pray a prayer that maybe you or I shouldn't, right? And God also had an issue with David. He was too bloodthirsty. In fact, that's why he wasn't allowed to build the temple. He was too bloodthirsty a king. 
And so sometimes David would pray a prayer in the Psalms that we could trip over and go, man, some of us, maybe, maybe you're looking into this whole God thing. You're like, I read through some of the Psalms, and what's with these prayers? Like, I, I can't even get through them without, you know, feeling like, oh, my gosh, this guy's such a violent person. Well, first off, again, he's a king. And secondly, God looked at that and said, David, no good. No good. Too bloodthirsty, right? And sometimes we have to realize, like, the Bible includes some things to describe something that it doesn't prescribe. You know what I mean? Like, like it's there for us to learn from, but not follow and do like what was done. And so David here is praying this powerful prayer here, but it's about his enemies that are coming against his nation. And then he says in verse 8, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. What do we do when life gets difficult? We cry to the Lord. We refuse to be afraid. And we take refuge in the Lord. This is the center verse of the entire Bible. Like if you took the whole Bible, before and after, right, like split it perfectly down the middle, this is the center verse of the whole Bible. And I think it's a beautiful center verse for the Bible. That we get to take refuge in the Lord. When you kind of look into this word, the, the, the imagery here is like camping out under a tree for shade on a scorching hot day. There's a tree in my yard that... I get to do this under. I have a little bench, and I'll be out working for hours in the yard, and I'll go sit under this tree that perfectly shades almost the entire day, and I'll just rest, and I'll relax for a little bit, right? And this is the rest or the refuge that God invites us into. When life gets difficult, let's take refuge in the Lord. Some of you guys just need to rest in his arms today. You need to relax into his love today. You need to fall back into his love and just allow him to catch you and hold you and restore you. You need to kind of just sit with him. You need to allow the truths of his word to just go deep into who you are. And so take refuge in him. I think about some of us, this verse, again, being the center verse of the Bible, better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. Some of us need to apply that to like our spiritual lives and our pursuit of God. Some of us are trusting ourselves rather than taking refuge in God. And what I mean by that is you're trying to earn your salvation. You're trying to earn your way to God. You're trying to produce enough good results that God will finally look at you and say, okay, I accept you. And we will never accomplish that in our own strength. Better to take refuge in the Lord. Better to rest in his love for us. Do you know that Jesus died on the cross for you because you and I can't work our way to him? Rest in that. Take refuge in him as opposed to trying to rescue or save yourselves. So David cries to the Lord. He refuses to be afraid. He takes refuge in the Lord. He, he continues with this theme in verse 9. He says, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. I'd rather trust in my God than trust in the most powerful people and rulers around me. And then it says in verse 10, and some of us can relate to this in, in a certain way. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. Okay? Now, obviously, we aren't King David, so we don't have nations surrounding us, but we do have difficulties surrounding us, don't we? Sometimes it feels like it's coming from every side. Sometimes it feels like we can't even look in a certain direction without seeing a problem coming at us. And again, as David, as a, as a military leader and king, he can pray, I'm going to cut these nations down. God, cut these nations down. They're trying to destroy us. But I want you to think about verse 11 very personally, okay? Because this is a really personal verse to me. It says, they surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. What do we do when life gets difficult? Sometimes we go to battle. Sometimes we go to battle. What do I mean by that? So this verse means a lot to Kelly and I. My wife, Kelly, has had chronic illness for 16 years, like just debilitated. She's been in and out of the hospital. She's gone through everything that you can think of. We've prayed every prayer we know to pray. We've gone to every doctor we know to go to. We've had every test we know to get, and it just continues on, and it's exhausting, and we're tired. And we recently have felt like God kind of gave us this verse to go to battle with. For her health. And she kind of came to me one day and said, you know, I was reading Psalm 118, and I just feel like this verse, like, surrounded on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. It's how we're supposed to approach just this, this sickness, this illness, this battle. And so this is what we do. We take this verse, and we go to battle with it. We take this verse, and, and we say, all right, 
whether this is a, a physical thing only, if it's a spiritual attack, if it's both, we're just going to grab a hold of this verse, man. We're going to pray this verse, and we're going to trust God to cut this thing down. And some of us, that's exactly what we need to do in our time of difficulty. we got to go to battle. we got to grab a verse, maybe this verse or another verse like this, and we're going to go to battle with that verse, and we're going to start to pray it and just declare it over our situation and ask God to be merciful and ask him to be gracious and to break that thing down. Now, we need God's leading in this because there's times in the Bible where God says, be still and know that I'm a, I am God, right? And then there's times that we take a verse like this and we go to battle. So be led. Again, if the shoe fits, some of you, the thing you need to do most right now in the midst of your difficulty is just take refuge in the Lord and rest in him. You don't need to go to battle. You need to let him hold you up. But some of us need to go to battle. And I'm guessing as I'm saying these words, you kind of probably know who you are. You know if you just need refuge in the Lord right now. You know if you need to not allow yourselves to be afraid. You know if you need to fight. And I love the verse after this. It says, They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. I love that idea. I told some of my friends who who are musicians as Burning Thorns is an epic name for your next band. Like, that's just country, metal, whatever you want to do, it works, right? But what a powerful thought. Like, we've all seen a log burn, and that thing gets put in that fire, and it burns for a little bit, takes some time. But I don't know if you've ever burned, like, just a branch, or imagine just a little thorn on a branch, how quickly it would burn in comparison. And I just love that idea. And this is our prayer for my wife, Kelly. God, it has been a long 16 years. We are just so tired. So Lord, we just pray that we see this this thing cut down and burned up and dealt with and eradicated as quickly as a burning thorn. Maybe some of us need to make that our prayer today. What truths do we need to get deep within us for times of celebration and difficulty? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let that be within you so it oozes out of you in the time of difficulty. And what if these truths helped keep us stable in our mental health, in our spiritual life, and in our ability to look at the difficulties of life without going up and down as life tends to throw things at us? What do we do when life gets difficult? We cry to the Lord. We refuse to be afraid. We take refuge in the Lord as some of us need to go to battle. And if we do, I'll tell you who we'll be. We will be a celebrating, joyful, fearless people. We'll be a people with our eyes on the Lord. We'll be a people who take refuge in the Lord, who rest in him. We'll be a people who know when we're supposed to go to battle and we'll go for it. We'll grab a hold of a verse and we'll speak it and pray it over our situation until we see breakthrough. If you're not a follower of Jesus here today, I want you to think back to that center verse of the Bible. Let's read it again. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. Which means it's better to take refuge or it's better to rest in the Lord than trust in yourself or anybody else. No one else can save you. Your parents' faith can't save you. Mike and Caitlin's faith can't save you. You can't save yourself, but rest in the Lord. Take refuge in him. Fall into his love. Trust in him fully and look to him for salvation. We worked our way through this passage looking through the eyes of Jesus a few times, about to be crucified, dying in our place, but then rising back from the dead a few days later, defeating Satan and hell sin and death for you and I that we could have a relationship with him what an amazing gift he gives to us what an amazing offer he holds out for you and me let's pray together so God we just are so thankful that we don't walk alone through our difficulty and there's so many different things that we could apply to our lives when life gets difficult and I thank you that even one of those things that I didn't mention today is that we have each other that we can leave, lean on each other, even this prayer team that's launching today. We can receive help today in our time of difficulty. I know that this church is a family. I know that they are doing this life together. And so I pray that 
God, for each of them as they go through difficulty, they will find support and strength from one another. But God, I thank you that we can come right to you. And I pray that that truth, Lord, that we can give thanks to you, that you're good, that your love endures forever. I pray it would run down deep into who we are, God. And when life squeezes, that that truth would ooze out. That when we celebrate, that truth would come out. Let it be deep within us. May we remind each other. May we say it as we come and go and, and write it on the door posts of our home, so to speak. God, let it go down deep within us. I thank you that no matter what we're facing today, we can give thanks that you're good, that your love endures forever. And I pray for us, God. We'll know kind of which shoes to put on, God, today. If we need to cry to the Lord for help, if we need to refuse to be afraid. God, if we need to take refuge in you, fall into your love, relax into your love, or if we need to grab a hold of a scripture verse, we need to go to battle. Lead us, God. I encourage you now to kind of just put on one of those shoes. Just kind of leave here knowing today which one's for you. Put it into practice this week. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I encourage you today to look to him as Savior. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than trust in yourself or anyone else. So look to him for salvation. Maybe you could even just quietly pray something like this. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for coming to be my Savior. Thank you for offering this gift of salvation. My eyes are on you. Be my Savior. Rescue me.